Hello, it is April 4th, 2024, and this is Political Dharma with Alan Zundel. This week, I have stories about independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. getting on the ballot in a couple of more states. A pseudo party drops its bid to try to get a presidential candidate on the ballot. And in the major parties, with the major parties, their primaries are still ongoing, and we continue to see significant vote dissenting against the candidates, candidacies of Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So that's what we have coming up. I'll give you those stories and my commentary on those stories. Then at the end of the show, what to look forward to in the uh, presidential campaigns. That is important dates that will be coming up this summer, uh, like the landmarks of progressing towards the eventual election, which still seems kind of far off, but it's coming fast. And finally, some updates on this show things I would like to talk about in um, future episodes as well and other changes going on. But first, for the sake of you who are new to the show or those of you who have a short memory, I did have thumb surgery a couple of weeks ago. They took off the cast, but I'm in this temporary splint now, which means my fingers are a little more free on my right hand, which is my dominant hand. So I can do a little bit more on a personal level, but still it makes it hard to do adequate pre-production for this show as I would normally like to do digging up more stories and I hope to get back to that as my hand continues to heal it also makes it a little awkward sometimes to do transitions on this show so give me a little allowance there if uh, I come up with the wrong slide or something like that so that's what we got in the works and um, first story up is Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the independent candidate this year for the presidency, not the one, there's two of them, also have Cornell West running, but not a lot of news about him, I am uh, sorry to say. Um, Kennedy, his campaign managed to get on the ballot in the state of North Carolina, and they did this as, uh, not putting his name as an independent candidate, but putting his political party, we the people, on the ballot, and then that party is going to nominate him as its presidential candidate, which is the same thing that Kennedy's campaign did in Hawaii. And in Idaho, he got on the ballot as an independent candidate, as he has in a few other states like Utah and Nevada. So that brings us to a um, a total for Kennedy, if if you're watching this, you can see it on your screen. Kennedy's on the top there in the light orange. Total of 10 states that he has enough signatures to be on the ballot in. Uh, if I'm remembering right, those are Utah, uh, New Hampshire, uh, Nevada, um, <laughs> forgetting the rest, Georgia, uh, M- Michigan, I think. Uh, anyway, I, I'd have to scroll through them. But that doesn't mean he'll actually be on the ballot in all those states because there is a um, effort, Some half of those, about four of those, were collected by American Values 2024, the super PAC that has been backing Kennedy's campaign. And I'm trying to make a transition again here. Okay, there we go. About four of those states... American Values 2024, a super PAC that's not supposed to coordinate with this campaign in order to qualify to get larger donations, uh, has been challenged. The um, Democratic operatives have been busy and writing letters to secretaries of state saying this was some kind of illegal coordination with the Kennedy campaign, which is also gathering signatures to get on the ballot. And so they're challenging whether they're going to get on the ballot in those particular states. Uh, I wish I could remember them all. No, I thought I could, but uh, Georgia, South Carolina, I believe, Michigan. Um, forget what the other one is. But even though they have enough signatures, that's not a guarantee yet that he's on the ballot. He is definitely on the ballot in Utah. I'm pretty confident he's on the ballot in Hawaii, the We the People Party is. But overall, that brings us um, back to the subject of him trying to get on the ballot. And they're doing something novel in Let me get out of the background there. Let's see, in Ida, Iowa, excuse me, Iowa, they are holding an assembly 
in Iowa, you only need to gather 500 eligible voters together in the state at one time. And if they each sign a form attesting that they are present at the event and want to put Kennedy on the ballot, they can do that. So 500 people doesn't sound like a heck of a lot for somebody with Kennedy's uh, fame to identify in Iowa and get together. So I think they have a good chance of doing that. Now, in um, here in Oregon as well, it's the same type of situation where he, uh, I don't know the transitions here <laughs> get a little tough. Uh, same type of situation in Oregon where they, there's been talk of trying to get together an assembly, but they need more than 500 people here in Oregon. I think it's more in the like 1,000 or 1,500 range, maybe 1,000. It's not impossibly large, but it's also not really easy to get them all together at one place in time. So I think they might attempt that there, or they might simply go the route of trying to get the signatures to get them on the ballot. Anyway, that's jumping way ahead to Oregon. So I think they'll be successful there now. That's the story it's about him getting on the ballot. He's making progress, and as deadlines come up, they're going to want to get going on a lot of these others. Now that he has a vice presidential candidate, Nicole Shanahan, he is able to get on the ballot in uh, nearly half the states, I think, require a vice presidential candidate to be named in order to get on the ballot. And since he named Nicole, he will uh, have a, uh, they'll be making swifter progress in getting uh, signature gathering started in a lot of states in the next month or two or three. I think deadlines, The all the states have different deadlines for getting the signatures in. Some already passed or we're very close to now. And the, the latest are in August. So he's got time in some states to do this. But then again, some states have very high populations. So it's going to be really hard to get those. The hardest one really is New York because they have a tight deadline. You got to start. You can't start later than a certain date. And you got to be done by another date. And I think it's a very short window, like about two months. New York is a big state and they got a high population. I think the requirement, I should have looked this up before. That's one of those pre-production things. Uh, but Texas is a tough nut to crack to get on the ballot. So when they do that, you can really celebrate that they have a uh, pretty efficient and effective campaign. Now, on the subject of him having a vice presidential candidate, Nevada, as I said last week, is holding off from approving their signatures because they said he needed a vice presidential candidate on his petition and on his declaration of candidacy even though they told him ahead of time he didn't have to do that. So that's unresolved as well. He may have trouble getting on the ballot in Nevada or have to start all over again gathering signatures. Kennedy's campaign did say this week that they're, they're going to bring this to court if they have to. So we'll wait to see how that turns out. Where are we at now? Um, on the subject of vice presidential candidates, some of you were rooting for Tulsi Gabbard, the former congressperson from Hawaii, who... Uh, is kind of a very independent figure, just like Kennedy. She left the Democratic Party to speak her mind more freely. She's not currently in office, to my knowledge. She's more appearing on podcasts and things like that, like Kennedy does. Uh, so some of you are hoping for her. There was a news story this week that she said she had been in talks with the campaign, with Kennedy's campaign, as a, to be a vice presidential candidate, but uh, she said it it didn't work out. And the campaign said something similar along the lines of they were in talks, but it didn't work out. So for you Gabbard fans, it wasn't, at least to all appearances, it wasn't one side or the other simply saying, no, it was mutual decision, I guess. This reminds me of how several shows ago, when Kennedy was about to appear in Hawaii, there was speculation, which I repeated, that maybe that was, um, he was going to announce Tulsi as his vice presidential candidate at that point. So now I'm curious if they had been in talks just previous to that, and they were hoping that in Hawaii, where she's from, he could make that announcement of her, but that's water under the bridge at this point, right? So what's up next? Let's see. The No Labels Pseudo Party, I call it a pseudo party because it hasn't really um, organized itself as a party. It organized itself as a... Uh, pretty much as a kind of a social welfare organization, maybe even a PAC. I'm, again, one of those things I should have double-checked. But in order to accept donations from donors who can remain anonymous, they did not organize as a political party. 
but they raised money and they used it to try to start signature uh, drives to get on the ballot in various states. But this week, let us look at this one. They bowed out of the race. They said uh, they're not um, going to have a presidential candidate. They gave various reasons in various forums. And the, um, let me bring this one up, a different story from a different publication. <clears throat> this is from the Ballot Access News. They talked about how, uh, well, first of all, they had a 20-minute Zoom meeting with some of their main supporters and talked about the fact that they're going to give up on getting a presidential candidate. They didn't say much about where No Labels already was able to become a political party, get on the ballot, what they're going to do about that, if they're going to withdraw that application, or they're going to allow other people to run under the label for other offices, or whether they continue to work for easier ballot access for future elections. They didn't say any of that. But what they did say, and uh, I had a video, but I forgot to queue it up or even put it in my queue here, which was about um, the real reason was that no labels could not find a viable president, what they regarded as a viable presidential candidate or a credible one. They were turned down by a lot of people they approached, and uh, I assume they were approached by some people that they thought would not be able to run an effective campaign, getting enough attention or having a much much success to speak of just uh, didn't work out for them. So they're done in the presidential race, which takes away a lot of the focus of the Democrats from worrying about a centrist candidate pulling votes from Biden, who is often presenting himself as a centrist, not giving in to the far left, which to me is, you know, simply New Deal Democrats. It's about as far left as most of them go. So, uh, I forgot what I was just talking about. Uh, let's see, he's uh, a centrist. Oh, the centrist, they're not going to be on the ballot. So they are starting to um, focus on Kennedy as their main threat uh, with the assumption that he's going to take maybe some votes, take away, as though someone owned those votes in the first place and he's a thief. Take away some votes from Trump, but take away enough votes from Biden that he may swing the election to Trump. That's their big worry. So they've been attacking him Talked about this in a couple of shows. They got this big operation going on, including many organizations affiliated with the Democrats, the Democratic National Committee, the Biden campaign, uh, paid operatives and opposition researchers. They're starting to do a lot of this. And you're going to see more and more news stories focusing on Kennedy, particularly on stories that are, what, um, designed to make him look bad. And, of course, they do that with every candidate for election, for the most part, because those are the things that people like to read. They like negative news more than positive news. I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to cover each one of those stories and parsing out where I think it's accurate or where I think it's skewed or biased. A lot of them are biased. They're just biased towards the negative in general. But in Kennedy's case, there seems to be an effort mostly to you know, focus on things that he's not running on. His, his big issues, as far as I can tell, have been the corporate capture of the government bureaucracy as well as politicians in Congress and the presidency. He wants to undo that. And chronic disease, the epidemic of chronic disease. Now, both of those issues are important to me. We've had chronic illness in our family, and I know from uh, meeting lots of other people in a similar boat that this is widespread. You might think this is only related to vaccines. I don't think so. Um, in the Kennedy campaign even. I don't think they're just focusing on that. Um, they're looking at a variety of causes. Anyway, they want to focus on chronic illness and corporate capture of the government. I think those are important, but you rarely see them come up in stories. Usually they're focusing on specifically on what they call anti-vax, vaccine skepticism, being a spoiler, the horse race thing. So anyway, I'm not going to be parsing out every article that appears because there's going to be a lot of them. What I'd like to do is something different, which I will talk about in a moment. Uh, what else is up? I think I had a third story here. Oh, yeah, the um, the major party primaries. So the um, major parties, even though Joe Biden and Donald Trump each have gained enough delegates in the early primaries to be the their party's nominee, there's still primaries ongoing, and in these primaries, 
there have been a lot of voters who have been voting on the Democratic side for uncommitted or uninstructed or similar things as a protest against the, um, the Biden administration's support of Israel's, and I'm, I'm willing to call it a genocide in Gaza because it has more and more looking like that, that they're trying to wipe out that culture and totally displace the people who have been living in that area for a long, long time. So let's take a look at what the results have been. All right, I've put it up on the screen, and I'll walk, it, I'll walk through it for those of you who are listening to this as an um, audio podcast. So on the Republican side, the four states last Tuesday held primaries, Wisconsin, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island. And what you see is that in just about all these cases, Nikki Haley, who has already suspended her campaign and given up, uh, no use in you know campaigning when somebody's already in effect, won the nomination, but she's getting anywhere from a little over 10% of the vote to a high of 14%, 10%, 10.6% in Rhode Island, 14, uh, let's see, let's go upwards, 106 in Rhode Island, 129 in New York, 13.1 in Wisconsin, which is a swing state, and 14% in Connecticut. Now, Donald Trump has not gone into the 90s in any of these races. He's in the low to mid-80s. Lowest was in Connecticut, where he got 77.9%. And then Wisconsin, 81.3%. New York, 82.1%. And Rhode Island, 84.5%. Now, in a couple of these states, you may notice that these figures don't add up to 100%. In a couple of them, people were still voting for other candidates who have suspended their campaigns, such as Ron DeSantis or Chris Christie, depending on who is still on the ballot when they go to vote in the primary. So there are a fairly significant number of people who are showing a dissenting vote for Donald Trump. They know these other candidates cannot be the nominee. It's already pretty much decided by the delegate how many delegates Trump has won. But still they are saying they're dissatisfied with this nominee. So that's a potential problem for Trump going into the general election. Might he lose these people who are voting for other candidates? It looks like that's well over 10% of them. Um, And in a close election, especially in swing states where the results can be very, very close between the Democrats and Republicans, it could portend problems for him. Now, on the other side, Biden's got similar problems. You look at this uh, in Wisconsin, New York, Connecticut, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and we see that I've combined together all the other votes, so each of these should add up to about 100%. In Wisconsin, let's start at the bottom. Rhode Island, he got the lowest percentage here, 82.6%, as against other candidates in options where they got 17.4%, which is pretty high. Uncommitted, got 14.9% of the vote. That's almost 15% of the Democratic voters saying that they are objecting to Biden's policy toward Israel. And then Dean Phillips, who did suspend his campaign, got 2.6% of the vote, which adds up to that 17.4%. So this is similar to Donald Trump. Biden's getting a little over 80% of the vote as opposed to nearly 20% of the people. I'd say a little over 15%. That is right between, it's 17.4. It's right between uh, 15 and 20. But this is a significant number of voters who are saying, you know, we don't want Biden. Democratic voters, or at least voters in a Democratic primary. I don't know in each of these states if it's an open primary allowing people who are not affiliated with the party to vote. Uh, but in some of them it is, some of it isn't. But it's pretty consistent across all these states. Now let's go up to... The next highest uh, for Biden, 84.9% in Connecticut, as opposed to 15.1% for others. And in Connecticut, that was, uh, let's see, they had uncommitted, got 11.4%. Marion Williamson, who's also, no, she's still in the race. She's suspended, then unsuspended. She got 2.3%. Dean Williams got 0.9%. Sank Unger got 0.5%, and then Uncommitted, as I think I said, got 114 So high number of votes for Uncommitted, um, and there was 
votes for other candidates as well, telling Biden they're not happy. And then going up to the next one, Wisconsin, Biden got 88.6% as opposed to other. And that other was uninstructed, 8.3%, and Dean Phillips, 3.1%, making a total of 11.4%, choosing someone other than Biden. And then finally, in New York, where Biden got the highest percent, 91.5%, as opposed to 8.5% for other other meaning in this case, uh, Marion Williamson got 4.9 and Dean Phillips got 3.6. They did not have the option, as I understand it, of something like uncommitted or uninstructed. Uh, so they weren't able to do that. Otherwise, I suspect this would be high just like the rest were. All of them above 10% for other than Biden, some of them as many points uh, many percentage points higher than that. So what can we make of that? I would say that, uh, all right, there we go. <laughs> I would say that the fact that this is likely to be a very close vote based on the results of the previous presidential election, where it was a very close vote between the same two candidates and how all the polling's been lately showing that support for Trump and Biden, so far at least, is very close. That means that um, there are going to be enough dissatisfied people with the major parties that there's going to be a defection, very likely, to alternative candidates, which is one of the reasons I've been covering them. Also portends to me the potential for a significant realignment in which kind of groups going forward support each of the major parties. Now, Kennedy being a part of this race, if he really does do well, and so far he's doing fairly well getting started. We'll see if he continues to build on his success so far getting on the ballot and being in the public eye, getting uh, high favorability ratings. And not, not huge uh, support in terms of polls of who you would vote for, but still higher than most alternative candidates or minor party candidates. So if Kennedy can really build on this, that means that he might even get some electoral college votes. And of course, the hope is that he's going to get enough electoral college votes to win the election outright. Even if he doesn't, he might get enough in a close race to swing the outcome to the, <clears throat> to the House of Representatives to finally decide who's going to be president. Now, any scenario in which there's a major disruption by an independent party candidate, whether it's the height of winning or the low of getting one electoral vote and polling significant numbers of people from the major parties. Usually you think getting towards the election, people are going to get cold feet, say, well, you know, I'm not sure the independent candidates got a chance, so I better revert to which of the two parties I'd prefer the lesser evil argument. If a candidate is an independent or minor party candidate who's doing particularly well, that will encourage more of those voters who are a little uneasy about it to take a chance on that candidate could snowball into something significant. And I think at the very least, we could see a uh, major shakeup in the two parties. I think already there's been somewhat of a shakeup. Trump uh, uh, revising somewhat the Reagan coalition behind the Republican Party that's been in place for pretty much since the 1980s. Trump, of course, still basing his main source of support on the business class, particularly smaller or local regional wealthy people, millionaires, billionaires, and uh, the evangelical vote, which has been centered on abortion primarily. And now that the Supreme Court has overturned Roe versus Wade, how many of those evangelicals are going to continue to stick with Trump? What else does he have to offer them other than a very unchristian life? <laughs> and there's a lot of pushback on abortion. So there may be some, dis, you know, this disenchantment among the evangelicals. And finally, Trump's coalition is made up of all these people that he's brought in who I would call the, what, the um, unattached or the the people that have gotten disoriented or dis outside of the mainstream. They've, they've detached themselves from the mainstream because they're so sickened by things that are happening. So I would say this is QAnon type people with these types of beliefs, these types, meaning some of them may make some sense. I don't know. A lot of them don't. Or people who are white nationalists, They've been covertly part of the Republican 
coalition since Nixon, at least, but more overt now. So bringing in these people that are kind of de detached from the uh, mainstream of politics, as we've understood it, uh, he's brought a lot of those in. So how the party might change and who might compose the main, uh, co the main groups behind the Republican Party could change. On the Democratic side, Biden, I think, has rearranged the Clinton coalition that's been in place since the 90s, stuck with it to a large degree, but he's <clears throat> been trying to uh, move a little closer, uh, keep the progressives a little more in. Of course, Clinton tried to do that, but he was, you know, the, Biden's being a little more, trying to throw bones to the progressives. I think the main difference with Biden is in his economic policy. He's moved a little bit away from neoliberalism, neoliberalism which is the whole trend of... Uh, cutting government spending, cutting taxes, cutting regulations, promoting this whole worldwide free market that has not worked out well for the American worker. Trump's picked up a lot of those dissatisfied workers. Of course, the Republicans have been doing that since Reagan. And Biden's made a play for those workers as well, showing some support for unions. And um, anyway, he's trying to maintain that Clinton coalition, keep it organized around a somewhat different policy of infrastructure investments and more of a national uh, economic policy program. I don't know how much of that has got across to people. I don't think a lot. I think he's losing a heck of a lot more people because of his stand in about Israel and Gaza. So it could be a very interesting race. It has been an interesting race. And I'm seeing time is already running out. I can't believe it. Did I have anything else that I wanted to do? Oh, yeah. Let's turn to this thing. Here's the schedule for what's coming up in the presidential campaigns. As you see, at the end of May, the Libertarian Party is going to hold its national convention and choose its nominee. Um, I haven't been talking a lot about the candidates for the Libertarian Party. There's a lot of them. I think they're all white men, and I simply don't have the resources to cover them all. But once they get their nominee, I'll be taking a look at that person. And in July, the Green Party holds their convention to all appearances, it looks like Jill Stein, who's been their candidate twice previously, will probably win that uh, nomination. But there is other candidates who are running for the position, and they may have a surprise upset with, with if Stein is regarded as the frontrunner. So I'll also be interested to see who's that going to be. A uh, Republican National Convention that's simply going to coordinate Trump. He's already won enough delegates. Of course, between now and then, who knows what happens? Major health event, he could die, he could be in prison. Nobody knows. Uh, I doubt if he'll be in prison. At most, they put him in house confinements, I think. But that could be a black mark on him. And the Democratic Party would nominate Joe Biden unless his wife uh, thinks his health isn't going to permit it or in some other way, you know, he the process gets derailed. I put presidential debates in question marks because they have not yet agreed to have presidential debates. Trump has been saying he's willing to debate Biden, but Biden has not responded with dates to set up for this in the uh, fall. If they do agree on having debates with the uh, National Presidential Commission sponsoring it, they've already set their rules, and it could be that Robert Kennedy qualifies to be in that debate if he continues to build on his um, campaign successes this far, particularly getting on the ballot in enough states to show he has at least a hypothetical chance of winning enough electoral votes to win, and having high enough um, polling to show that he's a serious candidate. So if we do have presidential debates, and Joe Biden seems not to like debating, <laughs> uh, I'll let you think of why that might be. We might also see Kennedy on the stage, or we might also see Trump and Kennedy. Who knows? Trump is pretty unpredictable. And then early voting starts in late October because some states like Oregon have mail-in ballots. And then finally, of course, on November 5th, it's election day, a long way off. And this show has kind of surprised me that I've gone on as long as they have. So what's happening with this show? I think I said earlier, what I want to do is move away from the presidential horse race and start looking at candidates and their particular positions on issues. And it's a tricky thing because what they say or what they put on their website is not necessarily something that they're all that serious about. So I want to have you know, dig into their past, their past policy positions, also their coalitions behind them and what kind of things they're promoting that are likely to show up in their, if they, if they win the presidential election, what kind of policies they'll be pushing. So I want to take a look at more of that stuff. Kind of hard for me to do with,
this uh, splint on, slowing me down a bit. And also, um, because I don't know the candidates yet, the, the nominees of the major, of the main minor parties, the Libertarians agree, I don't yet know for sure who their nominees are going to be, so I don't want to talk about them too much. So we might have a uh, challenge just coming up with things to talk about the next few weeks. But I'll continue to report on our current events and start transitioning into that, looking a little more closely at the various uh, candidates and their positions that they're taking. Um, if you like this show, please hit the like button, depending on where you're listening or watching it from. I appear on YouTube, on Rumble, and I also have audio. I think I appear on Spotify too, if you can get videos with it, and uh, audio form on other podcasts as well. Do look for it. Subscribe if you like it, if you don't want to uh, lose, um, miss future shows. And I have been saying to donate to the show. If you'd like to donate, you could use the link, which I'll put at the end of the program notes. People have reported to me that they've had trouble making that link work. They get to a page that says the link is broken. I suspect that may be because YouTube is blocking people from going directly to PayPal in order to continue to capture income from people watching this uh, rather than me getting any income from it because I don't want to put commercials on it. But what I've done is I've revitalized my Political Dharma website. So if you go to www.politicaldharma.com, you will see on the homepage a big box saying, click here if you would like to donate to help support this show financially. So I thank all of you who have been pointing out to me that you presumably tried to donate and had problems. Now you have a way to do that. Just go to politicaldharma.com and you can do that directly from my website. I'm also going to try to start out a regular blog, blog writing about things in between shows, but we'll see how far I get while well, my hand's still not quite in shape to do that kind of thing. Is that it? I think that's it for this show. And uh, thank you very much once again for having um, tuned in. And I hope you will tune in again next week. So, bye for now. With ease I see the chains are breaking. We gained our focus. The moves we're making will prove to determine our self-worth as a passenger on this vehicle. Earth.